please call me Andy. Uh, friends call me Andy. Only people that don't like me call me Andreas. Or if I did something rude, like my parents might did something rude. So please start with Andy and we'll figure out if we have to switch to Andreas. I've been working in the software industry for about 20 years and most exclusively in performance engineering and performance testing and performance monitoring. Um, broke a lot of apps and now trying to figure out why apps break. This story is not necessarily about performance, but it's more about how we as a company, I'm working right now at Dynatrace, how we transformed from an enterprise company that delivers software twice a year <coughs> to a company that is, here we go, <laughs> dealing with uh, HDMI issues. <laughs> With in. We'll, we'll go with it. Uh, but first question for us: Who is working for a startup? Right. Who is working for an enterprise company with legacy software? Who is in a, on a journey to transform and, and deploy more often than before? Who succeeded in that? Yeah. Cool. Who has shared the story with others? So the way I, when I share my story, I try to always start with explaining the journey we went through to somebody that might not be from the IT industry and that might not be technical. So what I did, I tried to figure out how can I explain DevOps transformation to my parents, as you can see here. My mom and my dad, he's probably just watching a Formula One Grand Prix with the headphones on because my mom hates it when it's like two hours of this noise. Uh, but they sent me selfies all the time. I gave them an iPad uh, two years ago so that they can heckle me around the world, and harass me around the world. But here's the thing, I get home about three times a year and then they always ask me, so what is, what are you doing? Then I explain what I do and then the next day when we have a dinner with family members or friends, they say, Andy's fixing computers. <laughs> so that's kind of what it boils down to. So I thought, I'll try to figure out a way how I can explain to them, first of all, what I do, but really more importantly, what we are going through in an industry. Right, the whole transformation. So I said, remember back in the days when I was still living in Austria, and we went on a trip, we had a camera like this in our pocket. Right? Pull a camera with our 24 or 36 film roll, we started taking pictures, and if the film roll wasn't full, we didn't just randomly take pictures to make it full, but we took the camera home with us and went on the next trip, maybe a week or months later, <coughs> until we had the final product, which was 24 features in the box or 24 pictures in the box. That's so what we did. The software engineering tool, we crammed a lot of features in a six month release. Then we send it to somebody that actually knows what to do with it. They develop the pictures. I'm sure they have quality control. There's a guy sitting in the, or a woman uh, sitting in the, in the dark room and looking at the picture and said, This is the best quality I can produce. So let's ship it back to the customer. This was typically the moment when he got excited. The envelope with the pictures. What is, which pictures do we take? Get. <laughs> well, we include a release notes of 50 features that nobody remembers anymore that we actually built. <laughs> and then some, uh, sometimes you figure out, oh, it's actually not what I expected. Somebody photobombed our picture. <laughs> or in the software industry, it is we built something and it took us six months to deliver and now it's no longer relevant for the customer. It's not what they expected and they went into the competition, which leads to frustration. This is the old way of software engineering. Now the new way, how I believe we're moving towards, is the way we take pictures these days, and this is where I have to bring in my wife. Um, so back when I actually started the story, we were still dating, but that's that's, uh, that's changed recently. Uh, it seems a bit more with right? But two years ago, thank you. Uh, two years ago, I brought her on a trip to Austria because I. So she's from Colombia. I met her in Boston on the dance floor because we're both salsa dancers. And then I thought, she could be the woman of my life, let's bring her to Austria, because eventually I want to move back to Austria. So we went on a trip to the Alpine Lakes, and she starts taking pictures with her iPhone. So she loves Apple, she has her iPhone. <coughs> she takes one feature at a time, one picture at a time. She sees immediately how the pictures probably going to look like. But thanks to Apple, or in your case, maybe some other device, she has a fully baked-in deployment pipeline, delivery pipeline on her phone, which means she has the camera that takes a picture, she has tools in there to make the pictures better, putting filters on it, whatever else you can do, right? And then seconds later, she can decide, this is so good, I want to share it with the world. I want to deploy it into production. Her production is Instagram and Facebook. The customers that she wants to make happy is mainly her dad, who still lives in Colombia, and friends and family around the world. In order to figure out if this is the right thing, she looks at the likes, or the dislikes, or the comments. So if she gets a dislike, she can do a rollback, she can remove the, the picture. Right? If she gets likes, she's excited. If she gets a comment from her dad saying, interesting, I thought you were traveling the world with Andy. Can you prove that to me? 
Sure. Let's just run another iteration. Take a picture with Andy and the data host and demo and run it to the whole pipeline and make the customers happy that are demanding these features. All right? So this is what I call kind of user-driven continuous delivery, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but basically what it is, you can see I have some marketing slides borrowed. But what she has is a completely automated delivery pipeline, a set of tools. But she decides when to take which picture, how to make it better or good enough to deploy it in production, what to do with production data. And that's kind of the analogy that I explained to my parents. So instead of taking 24 pictures that we may see in a couple of weeks and we're excited about it, we can deliver something very fast and iteratively. Okay? It's the change from big bang to small iterations, but more importantly, instead of having dev test and ops, we kind of shift it by 90 degrees and we enable the developers to bring their ideas to market as fast as possible, supporting them through the pipeline. That provides the right tools for the technology that they choose and for the environment that they want to deploy into. Make sense? All right. So how does this translate to Dynatrace? To our story. Our CTO and founder, so he founded Dynatrace back in, in 2005, um, and he's still the CTO and founder after actually uh, two iterations of our company. We got acquired twice, but he still, he still has this vision and he also helped us through the transformation. Um, by the way, he really has these funky glasses, so he's, and he's a really cool dude. Um, he brought us from two releases per year to 26 feature releases per year. So we deploy feature releases now to our on-premise and our SaaS offering every spring. So every two weeks we, we deploy uh, features. You can see we also do 500 production deployments per day, so these are not feature deployments, but these are changes we do in our environment. Our SaaS offering mainly runs on AWS, but very importantly is what you see on the bottom right. He said if something like the heartbeat happens or any other critical thing, we need to be able to push code changes to the pipeline within one hour. And that was the goal he set out. Right. The key thing was that we formed the DevOps team and the interesting thing with the DevOps team, our DevOps teams are engineers, but what they really are, they are a product team. The product that they are responsible for is the pipeline and all the tools around the pipeline. So things like pipeline visualization, integration with our development tools, uh, integration with logging and monitoring. So they are the product team that is building the pipeline and their customers are our internal application and development teams. So if I'm a developer, or if Mark, if you will be a developer, and you want to have, you want to build something on serverless, then you need to negotiate with the DevOps team. How can we get serverless capabilities into the pipeline? Because you want to have automated testing, you want to have automated deployments into the different environments, and you want to have monitoring. We started with seven people in the DevOps team. Now it's down to three, um, and that's perfectly fine with them. Uh, they completely manage uh, all our pipelines and make sure that our developers can push out features as fast as possible. A cool metric that I like, uh, kind of as many numbers I will discuss later on, but the biggest number for me is this one. 93% of production bugs are now found by developers before they impact customers. Why? Because not only do developers use our pipeline to push stuff into production, but they are also responsible for production. So that means when they deploy something, they need to make sure to look at all the monitoring, at the metrics, at the stuff that comes in, and then react on problems in case there are problems. The other numbers I'll talk about them in a second. Um, what I really want to do in the rest of the talk is talk about kind of our approach, uh, different steps we went through to get from monolith to doing both on-premise and SaaS, and kind of the lessons learned. And I start with the bi-mobile approach. And this is now where, I know this looks a little flipped from Waterfall uh, on, the, on the right and Nobs on the left. Uh, I started with the company nine and a half years ago. This is when we looked, our logo looked like this. We later got acquired by CompuWare, which was, I always say, was a curse and a blessing. It was a curse because all of a sudden we were a big company with strange processes that we never thought existed. <coughs> or things like you couldn't send an email with more than five megabyte attachments. Something like this all held us back. Uh, we then uh, became Dynatrace again. Uh, but what we did with our on-premise product, we kind of lifted and shifted it and went through a re-platform and re-architecturing effort. But what we also did, a couple of years ago, our CTO said in order to really stay relevant in our market, we need to leapfrog innovation. So we actually incubated a startup within Dynatrace. We set aside 80 engineers that could figure out 
what is the next generation of our product going to be like and how do we develop it and how we bring it to market. And then we brought everything back again under the Diamond Trace brand. So I call it bimodal, right? Taking the enterprise product that we had on premise and lifting and shifting it up and then building something completely new and combining it. So going back when we started with the whole thing, the first thing we thought, you know what we do? People are asking for SaaS-based monitoring and we had competition like New Relic and AppDynamics and Datadog and they all had this model and we didn't have it. So we said we have an awesome product, let's just try to run it as a SaaS offering. And thanks to the CompuWare acquisition, we had many people in data centers and we said we want to run our software as a SaaS service in our data centers. Well, hard lessons learned. Back in the days, when we wanted to push a change out, we had to open up a change request that was discussed on a Thursday morning and potentially next week the change was deployed. It was obviously too slow. Our CTO told them, we give you three months. If you cannot speed up your processes, we go with somebody else. They couldn't figure it out, so we went with AWS. So that means, like they said, we run our software on our own using AWS. Um, obviously, developers said, well, this is not the job that I was paid for. I don't want to be developing software and running the software and being responsible for it. That was a big change. So what we did, this is actually when we founded the DevOps team, and Anita Engleder, she is a DevOps team lead here, um, started with, hey, let's, okay, I'll, I'll, my team will take care of pushing something into AWS, and I'm the first line of defense, until we figure out how we can build pipelines that are resilient, how we, until we can figure out that the software that we, that we deploy doesn't necessarily break at 2 o'clock in the morning and wake up developers. So it was kind of our first iteration. Um, last several lessons learned. Our first approach was not to go from six months to one hour, but we made it a step-by-step -step approach. We went from six months to one month. All right? And we learned it is pretty hard to install a one gigabyte monolith. It's hard twice a year already, but if we want to install it every month, it's even harder. And we forced ourselves to actually install and run our software that we want our customers to use and install to run it ourselves. It was really painful, and the, uh, and the installation process and after the process was painful. So we couldn't even use our own product in the beginning in SAS. So we had to come up with things, how to componentize the monolith. We didn't dissect it into microservices. So we just like componentized individual, uh, like scrapped out individual components to be able to automate, automatically update and roll them, uh, back, uh, to rollbacks. Uh, we had some AB uh, options to test. So this was kind of our first approach. The second thing, which I believe from a quality perspective was the biggest change. When we did sprint reviews, the it works on my machine and I can show you the feature on my machine is no longer good, right? Because that was typically what we had. Since I started with Diamond Trace in 2008, we always had two week sprints, but it was always like the edge of fall, right? So two weeks for a couple months and then two or three months of hardening. So we changed that where we forced our developers to demo their features at the end of the sprint in our own internal production environment, which means we're building monitoring software. We can use monitoring really well as a software company. So we forced ourselves to deploy every sprint build into our internal system that is monitoring our website, our support system, our internal and external Jira, our internal and external confluence. And if you are a developer and you said, I want to show this feature, and you commit yourself to committing that to master, you know it's going to end up in production and you potentially break things. And that happened. We brought down Dynatrace.com several times in the transition period. But the good news was we didn't punish people. Our CTO said, I expect there's going to be friction and I expect there's going to be problems, but I will shield you from corporate BS as long as you figure out how we can make this better in the future. It, happened, it took a couple of months to really get into a stable, into a stable mode. But this dramatically improved sprint quality. The other thing is, uh, end user feedback loops, we always thought we know, but we never really knew we knew. So for instance, we had in our enterprise product that people installed on premise, we had no clue which features were used. It was a job of which client that people were using to analyze data. So we built monitoring into that which client to figure out which features are actually used, which was awesome because it was the first time in history where we could point to sales people in our organization and say, you forced us to invest three months to build this feature to, to seal that deal, but now we know that nobody's using that feature. So internally we have like a little blacklist of people yeah. that we don't trust as much anymore. <laughs> and I know you're starting soon with us, so be aware, don't get on that list. 
Okay, so monitoring. Now with our SaaS based offering, it's easier obviously, but we monitor which features are used, which features are not used, and then this becomes part of the, the, the sprint planning. Um, also automatic error analysis. Um, we have a lot of support tickets, and when we, when we ask people to open up a support ticket, they need to upload the log files. And typically then our support engineers go, I look here, and if I find this, I look here, and if I find this, and I look here, and this is what I find, and I know it's this problem. So we just automated the whole process. So we built a rule engine that is automatically analyzing the log messages and does the correlation. And now we open this up to developers if they're writing a new feature and they know if something bad happens, I write this log message. And if this is there and this is there, then please automatically comment on the Jira ticket with the support that we use in support. So we use Jira internally or externally for our support. If people upload the log files, we automatically run the whole rule engine against it. And then we automatically post back to the customer, we think it's this and this problem. And we also use this to monitor um, usage of, of features. We call it Archie, it's our support archive analyzer. Uh, another interesting thing is we started to move our uh, to understand the cloud. So when we moved our, again, on-premise product to, to AWS, we thought this is cool, we can test new features, we can test new upgrades, and it's nice. So what you see here is a graph that shows on the one side memory and CPU utilization, and I think it was July 3rd, when one of our software vendors, we use a third-party login library, which I assume most of you use third-party login libraries, they told us you're on a version that has a potential security vulnerability, please update. We said sure, we just update, you know, we don't need to run any other great tests, we just update the library, and boom, all of a sudden memory usage went up by 40%, because there was a memory leak in that version they told us to upgrade, or at least in the way we use that logging library. If memory goes up, our system runs on Java, garbage collection goes up, which means CPU goes up. Now the cool thing about the cloud is we just get endless resources, but it also means that we have to pay a lot of more money to our infrastructure provider. Right? So we learned that lesson, so now what we actually do every time when we deploy something, when we run our tests, we always do memory dumps before and after the tests to figure out how many objects are left on the heap and compare it from build to build. So if I'm upgrading a library and in this build I have 10 million more string objects on the heap than in the previous build, then I know something is wrong. Okay, so automate memory diagnostics. So this is kind of how we lifted and shifted our, our enterprise product. We got our feet wet into the cloud. Uh, we kind of made experiences. Then I told you we did some incubate incubated, so we actually um, we, we kind of you know, had Dynatrace, our, our enterprise product, and then we, we founded Ruxit. So Ruxit was our code name um, of, of our startup that we founded within Dynatrace. We set aside 80 engineers and we told them, you figure out the next generation of our products. They also built a whole lot of new tools. Uh, back in the days, there was nothing like Hygieia available, or at least not that we knew of. Hygieia was the dashboard from Capital One that they used to visualize Python, which is awesome. We built our own stuff and we wanted to visualize pipeline quality. Every team saw which build and which commit is deployed in which stage. But a very critical thing was we wanted to give developers feedback within 10 minutes after code check-in. So what we did is we invested a lot in test automation, but more importantly, we said developers, because they're responsible for their quality later on in production, they can tell us which tests are critical for them, so we execute them first. But what we also did after every test execution, after every build, we looked at the whole list of, of tests and then we reprioritized them for the next build. Meaning, those that just failed, that we detected a regression should be executed first, those that are always green, there's no need to execute 10,000 tests that are always green, we take them into a different rotation, maybe once per day, maybe once per week. Okay? But we execute as many tests as possible within 10 minutes to give them feedback. What we do right now, we execute, as you can see, 31,000 units and integration tests per hour. Um, a lot of functional tests, we're using, uh, as you see, Selenium and Source Lab. We, reuse heavy, we make heavy use of Docker to run a lot of these tests in parallel, to just cram more tests into these 10 minutes. But what we also thought, this is just mainly doing functional tests. That's why we are adding monitoring to our tests. So while we execute our functional integration tests, we are capturing additional metrics from our APM. Right. And unfortunately, we built APM, so we just use our product. So that means what we actually do, we look at all these metrics, like number of database statements <coughs> executed, how many JavaScript files are on the page, and then we baseline these metrics automatically for every test and for every build. And Mark, I'm pointing at you now. If you are the 
you think you're the best developer, but if you make a code change or you bring in, bring in this new library, and then let's say the number of database statements goes through the roof or the number of string objects that are still on the heap goes through the roof, we detect the regression automatically. And we give you that feedback within 10 minutes, which means we break the pipeline, which means not only do we show it in Jenkins, but we also have a little visual indicator <laughs> that we call the pipeline state UFO. And actually, this is it. I actually have it here. So this is an open source project, or it came out of our engineering team, because our chief software architect who was responsible for quality, he said he's frustrated that developers constantly break the build, right, and they walk home. And he said, I wanted something that we can strategically place next to the coffee machine, which is also next to the office door. <laughs> and if the pipeline is not green, the, the bottom ring is pipeline quality, so it shows, obviously not green, so if, if it's red, either the unit test failed, the integration test failed, whatever tests failed. So it shows them the pipeline quality, and the top ring shows them the quality in production. Because remember, our engineering teams are also responsible for production. So we started with one UFO, we call it, you know, looks like a UFO, flying saucer. We started with one, and now every application team has their own UFO, because their pipeline and their feature in production. <coughs> so a little thing, it's actually on GitHub, so if you can deprint it and the code is up there, it's a really nifty thing. All right, another thing that we do, which is also dear to my heart, is we do continuous performance validation. Um, we have uh, Thomas, he's our chief performance architect. Uh, he's, he's performance testing different components of our software, and what he has, uh, he has an environment that is constantly under load. And what he does, he says, every day in the morning, I get the latest build from the night, and he's deploying it into his performance environment. First of all, he sees, if the plus the deployment still work, do we have any problems? But what he really says, if I'm optimizing certain components for performance, <coughs> either optimizing for response time, for resource consumption, for failure rate, or for throughput. <coughs> and so he's looking at what he calls a performance signature. Depending on which component he tests, he says, these are the five metrics that I'm looking at. And if I do this from build to build, automatically I immediately see if a certain component has a degradation in the signature. And then it depends, is it CPU, is it memory, is it throughput? Uh, and again, this also stops the pipeline. <coughs> Alright, so this is kind of the lessons learned what we do in pre-prod, like before everything goes into production. The other thing is, lesson what we also learned is we want to deploy, fail and recover fast. So here's an example now on, on how what happens in production. This is a dashboard uh, that actually our marketing team is using. On the top you see three lines, green, orange and red management friendly colors as I call them. <laughs> Number of people on our websites that are having a good experience, medium and bad experience, on the bottom is conversion rate. This is particularly for a, web, for a page on our website where people can sign up for a free trial offering. And the time frame is in May, so it was actually last year in May. On May 1st, our development team pushed some cool new features and the marketing team jumped on it and said, we're running a campaign. Right? So let's send out a lot of emails and get people on our new platform. They can well, now watch the APM metrics, you know, number of people go up, conversion rate goes up, so it seems they're actually hitting the right people and they're selling the right thing. So day, day one looks good, day two comes along, numbers still go up, that's great, but also the site is getting slower and slower, so the sign up process to sign up for our free offering got slower and actually conversion rate dropped because people are not that happy, right, then they have to wait. So they went to the stand up and then the marketing said, to the development team that's building that sign-up page, hey, something is not right. Things are getting slower, and if we want to keep continuing with this campaign, we have to do something, or we stop the campaign. And then Hubert, is his name, he stepped up and said, I think I know how to fix this. So he fixed it, he deployed the hotfix, and guess what? Immediately saw a drop in happy users, a jump in frustrated, and a drop in conversion. The UFO of the marketing team went red because their conversion rate was below target. But also the UFO of, U of Hubert's team, who is responsible for the website from a technical perspective, went red because they saw an unusual high number of JavaScript errors. Because what he did, he changed some of the, um, the, uh, the uh, API calls that our the, the sign-up page does. He tested it on his Mac, on his preferred browser, and neglected the fact there are still people like me out there that are running on Windows and on IE. So his fix broke our sign-up page for all users of Internet Explorer. But it was immediately visible, and he was immediately alerted thanks to the flashing UFO, 
And instead of getting patched from the marketing team, he said, I already have the fix available. I deployed it. We're back to normal. Okay. So this is actually how we can leverage this data on the development side, but also on, uh, on the marketing side. All right. Um, the last lessons learned. Uh, we figured out that having a lot of data is great, but if you don't know what the data means, it is not good. And if you don't have the experts like Hubert and the marketing team, if nobody looks at the data and knows if it's critical or not, it's a problem. So what we built into our monitoring is to tell when we send alerts, how we actually say how many people are impacted. Because if we have a problem right now and only two users are impacted, two users out of, of a million might not be a problem. So I don't want to be woken up at 2 o'clock in the morning, I don't want to do anything. But if it is a thousand users that are impacted and I only have two thousand total, then this is something that I should worry about. So this is an additional metric that we deliver. How many users or how many service calls are impacted right now? And we also wanted to make it a little easier to find the root cause. So what you see here is the same example as before with the JavaScript error. But instead of having Uber to dig through all the different metrics and figuring out is a JavaScript error on IE, we just automated the whole diagnostic process. So now it says, Dynatrace.com has a JavaScript error rate increased, uh, and it happens only on desktop browsers on Windows 7. So this is much more actionable, and it comes out right away. And then what we also, what we also have, uh, what we built into, into our monitoring solution is not only telling you there's a problem, but also all the events that led up to the problem, like what was the deployment, what was the last deployment, and how did this problem trickle through the system, and where did it actually hit your system, right? Maybe a CPU outage, or maybe a JavaScript error on a certain page. So we, we have all these things that's available. And the last thing we want to do, and hopefully I don't offend anybody, if I say no ops, I was shouted at by an, art, by an analyst last time when I used the word no ops because he said it's bullshit, because there's always going to be ops, and that's true, there's always going to be ops people, but our path to no ops of our, of our team is uh, we want to automate a lot of the remediation actions. So again, you saw this, we have how many people are impacted. So based on that, we can decide whether we actually you know, escalate this at two o'clock in the morning. So if three people are impacted, maybe not. But what we do now, what, what, what we do now do with the monitoring data, because we have this problem evolution, as we call it, and it starts with the electric flow deployment. So we, we are deploying something and then we see what else happens. We can now, build better auto-mitigation scripts, meaning whatever tool you use, in our case we also have a different set of tools we use to, to, to do deployments and mitigation, but we can then look at the data and say, hey, we deployed something at 2 o'clock in the morning, the first thing I saw was a CPU exhaustion on a service, so maybe I just added a new service, or we have high garbage collection, and I know we just changed some memory settings of the JVM, so maybe we just revert these settings. Or we did a blue-green deployment, and the problem is only with blue or green, so let's just switch automatically to the other one. Let's not wake up people at 2 o'clock in the morning, because that's not what people like. Uh, there's different options, and if we find a way to mitigate the issue, we also automatically send an update to the JIRA ticket, so we use JIRA internally for our tracking. So we automatically update JIRA and say, hey, developer, if you come in at 8 o'clock in the morning, I want to let you know that at 2 o'clock we had a problem, and here's what we did to mitigate it. I think you should still look at it. But at least we didn't wake you up in the morning. If something is still ongoing, then we do a rollback, and then we can mark the pull request as bad. Right? You come in in the morning and say, they totally had to rework my changes. Or if it's, you know, nothing solves the problem, then obviously we can escalate. What I like best of our story, and this is something that Anita and her team says, and also all the developers, they said, the biggest thing is we are proud of our features that we built. Why? Because they said, in, in the old days, we only got to see how our customers are using our product when they had a problem and they opened up the support ticket and they basically bashed us. Now, because we have direct access and we're actually responsible for the stuff we build, and we see how many people are actually using our features or not using, it's a much more direct feedback channel. So we see that the stuff we actually built is used or not. Or if it's not used, right, then we know we can negotiate with the product owners that we take this feature out because I don't want to maintain code that nobody uses. I don't want to maintain tests. All right. From our last step story, you know, we brought uh, this innovation.
innovation together. So I think it was for us, it was very important to stay on track with our enterprise product because it was our, it's our cash cow. But we also innovated by incubating a new startup, learning, building a new product, and then bringing everything back together. Lastly now, the numbers. I already mentioned the 93%. Um, I think I also mentioned some of the tests that we execute, uh, how many deployments we do and commits we do. I think a big contribution is really to quality by, by shifting left and testing more and, and using monitoring data early in the life cycle. But I have to say we were really lucky because most of the core engineering team within Dynatrace came from a previous company we most, we, we most, of, uh, most of us worked for, which was a testing company. So we actually came from a very big testing background. So testing was always ingrained in our DNA. Yeah, and I think, I think that's it. So hopefully, you know, it was a long path. It took several years. Um, but um, it paid off for us. And hopefully you got one or two ideas on what you can do better in your own transformation. Thank you. <laughs> and this is a uh, find on GitHub, the UFO. So we have a lot of customers or any company that are using the ability uh, at hackathon events. That was good. Thank you. By the way, you mentioned hot fixes in there. You've already got a 10 minute window for testing. You know, how did you designate hot fix? Is that just one feature, two features? Yes, yeah, so hot fix are. So our pipeline actually has three stages. Right? We have a dev, a dev stage, a, a staging, an internal, actually for dev, a, uh, a, like a performance environment, a staging, which is our internal production environment, and then production production. So that means if a developer checks in code, he gets immediate feedback within 10 minutes on what his code change is basically doing, right? Good or if there's any problem. And that then gets propagated into the next into the next pipelines, into the next phases. Uh, but we have a shortcut to just say, hey, the developer thought he can fix this problem that we had with a simple JavaScript change on the website. And he just bypasses <coughs> most of it, he just ran some local tests, but he said I, I do it right away. And, uh, and most of these, um, the 10 minutes window, these are mainly integration tests and unit tests. So we don't run the complete suite of regressions. And, and he said, you know, I have the power to deploy to make changes in production, but I'm also responsible for it. And that's what the, the decision he made. So it just shortcuts everything else. And you actually go back to that old process of where it runs on my machine. Exactly. Really what you're trying yeah. to do. But the good news is, because you make them responsible, and they are responsible for looking at the data and fixing it. Obviously, it's a painful, it's a painful lesson learned. But uh, yeah, we allow we allow people to shortcut, but it's their responsibility. So I really like that last slide. Um, but to put that in perspective, uh, are you able to get the um, 120 commits per day, uh, 31,000 units? Um, are you able to tell us how many developers uh, you guys have, and possibly how many lines of code there are? So uh, the exact numbers actually have on that's okay, no worries. Uh, the exact numbers. So we have 500 engineers uh, globally distributed across three major geos, uh, working uh, on I don't know how many teams exactly, but about 500 engineers, uh, different sets of technology. We also have not only the coolest and greatest, but also a lot of let's say more legacy. We have a lot of mainframe code there, um, and uh, lines of codes. Uh, I think I have the numbers somewhere, seven mil, I mean, you know, it's, it's in the seven, eight digit number. Yeah. And across all different sorts of, of technologies. We are heavily on Java, uh, but a lot of native code, as I said, also mainframe with a lot of variety there. And uh, if you want to know more, I actually have Anita and the CTO, both on the podcast and also on the webinar. So if you search for Dynatrace, I think that we called it similar to my talk, you will find the references and uh, Anita is going into very much detail how the pipeline works and will be executed. Great.